questions that I would love for us to explore before we dig into the Word of God this morning. And these questions are both personal and they relate to us as a church body. The question is this, are we going forward in our relationship with God? Do we sense that we're getting closer to God and the Holy Spirit and to the Son Jesus Christ and to the eternal life? Or do we sense that we are stepping backwards in our relationship with God? Are we going forwards or are we going backwards? This is a question we need to ask ourselves as a church as well. Do we as a church sense that we are plunging and we're going forward and we're excited and we're energized in our relationship with the Lord? Or are we as a church sensing God's presence getting farther and farther and farther away? If you open up God's Word, you see from the beginning starting with Adam and Eve and moving throughout the nation of Israel, there were times when they went closer to the relationship with the Lord than there was times when they hid and they wandered backwards. There's a hymn that uh, is always powerful. I'm not thinking of the hymn right now off the top of my head, but it says that my heart is prone to wander, to leave the God I love. And as I look throughout Scripture, I notice that the nation of Israel, when they were saved and delivered from Egypt, and they started to, to proceed into the wilderness where God, when he, he was going to have a tabernacle, He was going to be with them. What did they want to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back. I started my time looking at Joshua crossing over the Jordan, and our first message of the year was crossing over. But you know there were some, when they got up to the Jordan and it was flood season, and the, the waters were raging, it says, and the waters were intimidating. And they had to have faith and step into the water, but you know what, some did not want to go forward. Why? They were scared. They were scared of Jericho and the walls of Jericho. And they wanted to go backwards. But this was true of the early disciples as well. You remember when Jesus Christ was crucified? And even after they had heard that he had rose from the dead, what did the disciples want to do? They went back fishing. Not because they enjoyed fishing, but they said, we better go back to the mission, the original thing that we know how to do best. And they they wanted to go backwards, but Jesus Christ appeared to them, remember? And he had breakfast with them. And he said, go to Jerusalem, go forward and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then you will go forward into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But what did they say? Oh, no, we're just going to stay in Jerusalem. And the Lord brought persecution. And they had to be scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. They had to go forward, and as they went forward, you know what happened? They started sharing their faith with people who were called Gentiles, who were not Jewish. And they had a meeting in Acts 15, and the meeting was to decide, are we going to go backwards and go back to the rules and regulations of the Jews, or are we going to move forward in grace? Are we going to put barriers up? Or are we going to put hurdles up that are keeping us from moving forward with the gospel message, with the good news of Jesus Christ? I don't know where you're at today, and obviously you're in a transition as a church, and a lot of times churches in transition are actually going backwards. You may be saying, well, we're stuck in the middle, and I would say, if you're stuck in the middle, you're going backwards. Because forward is how God wants us going towards Him. Today we're going to look at two powerful parables that Jesus told us. They're found in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, I would encourage you to open up your Bible this morning and turn to Matthew 25. One of the 
objectives you guys have been working on is being a part of what the denomination calls missional communities. <laughs> and I know one of the Sunday school classes went through a book called Kingdom Come. And basically the book Kingdom Come and the denomination is trying to teach us there's a difference between the kingdom and the church. The church is a vehicle for the kingdom. The kingdom of God is about the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And in the kingdom, what we noticed about Jesus is he came to bring life. And he came to bring energy and joy and peace. He came to bring a blessing. He wanted people to have life and to have it more abundantly. That is the end. We are working for the kingdom. In fact, Jesus said, seek first his kingdom. In fact, the Bible talks about the kingdom more than it talks about the church. In fact, Jesus only a couple times made reference, and it's not the German word for church. He referred to it, it's called an ecclesia. It's a gathering of people who are coming out of the world, and they're joining together, and they're living their life on mission. You're saying, why are you talking about that? Well, these parables are about the kingdom of God. So it's not really about the church, it's about the kingdom. And you and I need to understand, if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, yes, we are members of the church, but more importantly, we are members of the kingdom of God. Jesus is building his church, but he's building the kingdom of God. Well, how does he teach us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name? Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit have a kingdom mentality. Matthew 25. One of my favorite uh, parables is Matthew 25. There's so much for us to learn. But notice what he says in verse 1. He says, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, let's, let's refer, refer to that as being the same aspect. It's the rule and reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. So he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins or ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. I love how Jesus teaches. He makes things very clear. So he would be here today. He says, these people are wise. They have chosen to sit on this side today. Okay? And these people are foolish. They chose to sit on this side. No. And he, he divides them up evenly. Five were wise and five were foolish. Now I want you to notice, they're all virgins. They're all bridesmaids. They're all focused in on the wedding feast. We as Christians and we as servants, we're not equal. Not all of us are acting wisely. Some of us are acting foolishly, even as believers in Christ Jesus. Now notice this. It says, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. That means they didn't have any reserve. They didn't have any extra. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And they were going to buy. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, open up to us. And he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, you know neither the the day nor the hour. Now, uh, we 
got a slide here that will represent my first point. The wise virgins, who I would say were moving forward, they seized the opportunity. They made most of the opportunity. The foolish ones ignored the opportunity. They didn't take advantage of the opportunity. In fact, they themselves closed the door on the opportunity. If you look at this parable and just try to say, what is Jesus trying to teach us? We need to notice first the similarities before we look at the differences. As I mentioned, they're all virgins. They all have lamps. They all initially have oil. Now, what does that oil represent? Well, some people think the oil may represent the Holy Spirit. Some say it may represent our faith. I tend to view the oil as a combination of everything. It's the spiritual resources that we have stored up as believers. It, it's the opportunities that we have taken advantage of. They all fall asleep. Some people are like, oh, they shouldn't be falling asleep. Yeah, they, they fall asleep because Jesus Christ, it's been a while since he's come back, hasn't it? It's 2,000 years. <laughs> The midnight cry is not meaning Jesus Christ is coming back at midnight. What it means is he's coming back when times are dark, when, when we're maybe not expecting. I don't know, have you ever been woken up at night? You know, I, we have a, a big dog, uh, we've got a sort of a pup, and every once in a while he, he sleeps in the garage, our daughter's allergic, and every once in a while you hear him start barking in the middle of the night, and I'm like, oh shoot, I, I live out in the country and got five acres and woods, and I'm not anti-guns, but I don't have a gun, you don't want me with a gun, but when I hear the dog barking, I get a little scared. So I say, Michelle, go out and check and see what's happening. <laughs> no, I, I don't do that. I, I am a big guy, so I get up and I go and I look and I see what's happening and why the dog is barking. But a lot of times, I try to be prepared, so I have a light by my bed. Again, I don't have a gun, but don't say I don't have a baseball bat underneath my bed. I, I try to be ready because I don't know what's going to happen in the middle of the night. And I don't know exactly why he is barking, or somebody's there, or somebody's outside, or maybe he just needs to go to the bathroom. But in either case, I try to be prepared and ready. And what Jesus is saying, we are all equal. We do not know. And if you do know, come and tell me. We don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. But all of us, the master, in this case, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the church is the bride, we need to be ready for when Christ returns. And here is the fundamental difference. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. The wise ones stored up spiritual resources. Let me just ask you, spiritually, how are you doing with your resources? If Christ came back at midnight tonight, are you going to be fresh in the Word of God and say, you have the Word of God in you? And by the way, he's probably not going to come back on Sunday. That's too easy. I'm sure he's going to come back Friday night, Saturday night. Again, when we least expect it, are you going to be ready? Do you have the Word of God in your heart? Have you stored up spiritual resources? Have you been talking with the Lord and praying? How about us as a church? Have we been about kingdom business kingdom mission, the kingdom agenda, are we just about our own agenda in our own church? The point that Jesus is trying to make is we need to be ready. And what I want you to know this morning is as a church and as individuals, we all need to be ready. We need to be ready. You know, whenever you invite somebody over to your house, do you usually try to clean up a little bit? Do you try to make it look like 
You're not pigs where you live, you know? You, you try to make things orderly and clean, and you want them to be comfortable, and maybe, and maybe if you're concerned about the electricity, maybe you got it hotter or cooler, just because you want them to feel welcome. You want to be prepared for your guests. My friends, we as a church and we as Christians, we need to be being prepared and ready because we don't know when our Lord and Master is coming back. Now Matthew 25 actually tells a couple of other illustrations and parables, and he continues on. And notice in verse 14, he says, For a, be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. Now, if you have your own Bible, I would encourage you to underline the word or circle entrusted. Entrusted is key. Jesus Christ, as his disciples and as kingdom representatives, we have been entrusted as individual servants and as a church with his property. Now, earlier in Sunday school, we were talking about a building, and a building has multiple purposes. And this is one of the reasons that I don't like the name church, because most of us, when we think of church, we think of a building. Yes, we've been entrusted with this building, but that's not what I'm talking about when we've been entrusted with the church. We've been entrusted with the people that make up the church. These are just walls. And as somebody said, I've seen many churches become a lot of things. I have a niece who lives in Pittsburgh, and a lot of the older churches have been renovated into art galleries and apartments and different things. Why? Because it's just a building. But we have been entrusted as a service with this church. And here's what he says. He says, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. Now, we need to stop here for a second. And I don't need you to raise your hand, but how many of you consider yourselves a five talent? How many of you consider yourself a two talent? And how many of you consider yourself a one talent? Better yet, I don't know where we're at with ourselves as a church, but we may consider ourselves a one-talent church or a two-talent church. I don't know if we consider ourselves a five-talent church. We would say, well, well, that's the big church down the road. Perspective is everything as we read this parable. Now, if you're wondering how much of it is talent, so five talents, literally some people believe at that time, and I can do the math and put it on the board for you, but basically Jesus is given a lifetime wages. So Jesus is giving a lot of money. So two talents is half a lifetime of wages. And one talent is probably maybe roughly a year or so or a little over a year of a salary. Now, if some church decided to say, hey, we're just going to pay you for a lifetime up front, I would be into that. Would you be into that sort of as if your employer says, hey, I'm feeling generous today, or some of you maybe who are getting Social Security, if the government just said, eh, we're, we're just loving giving away things this day and age. We're just going to give you all your retirement up front. And we're just going to assume you're going to live a very long time. That's what's going on in the story. And so I talk about this as multiplying your treasure. Multiplying your treasure. Notice what he says here. He said, so also, or he said, he who had received the five talents went at once. I circleized that. There's an urgency. There's like, a God has blessed me. You would think it would be the opposite way around. I, I, I just got paid a lifetime salary. I, I think I'm just going to, to kick back and relax. He says at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. Now this is a little 
somewhat different than the previous parable in that we see different amounts being distributed. But again, they're all servants. They're all slaves to their master. They're all expected to be entrusted. So there's a stewardship issue that everyone faces. And they all will be accountable for how they live their life. Here's what I've noticed over my years of ministry, and especially when it comes to money, because that's easier to illustrate. The less you have, sometimes your perspective is, I'm limited. And when I'm limited, I want to hold on to what I have. So for example, just when it comes to tithing at church, if I make only $100 a week, it may be hard for me to think, I, I'm going to give up $10, and I need to give that back to the Lord. You, you want to hold on because you're saying, well, it costs more, you know, my rent or my food or the gas in my car or whatever. I, I need to, and so we tend to view sometimes when we have less, we hold on from a limited perspective. But sometimes we say, and I've heard this a million times, Mark, if, if I won the lottery, I would give so much money to the church. If I, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that from a church member, I, I would be a very rich pastor. But uh, obviously that doesn't keep But our, our perspective is if, if I had unlimited resources, I, I would be very generous. Which, by the way, that isn't exactly true. But it's our perspective, and how you see yourself in this story is huge. Because if you view life from a limited standpoint, you're going to close your fist and you're going to hold on. If you view your life, and not just your finances, but your spirituality, your family, and everything as a gift from God, you're going to view it from an unlimited perspective. Again, in Sunday school class, we were learning about God's blessing, and there's a phrase in there, each day. Each day, God wants to bless us. Each day, God wants to give us His grace. Each day, He wants to, to see us experience His blessing. Each day. That's an unlimited perspective. So the question is, how are you viewing it? Now, what's sad is, a lot of churches I've worked with, and I've, I've worked in churches of 2,000 in size, and I've worked in churches smaller in size. The less size, usually they view themselves as one-talent churches. And with that comes a warning. And if you view yourself as a one-talent Christian, there comes a warning. Because you tend to view life limited, and you hold on. In fact, how's the story go? It says, now after a long time, the master of the servants came, and he settled accounts with them. And he, he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I've made five more. And in my Bible, I'm underlining made and more, made and more, made and more. We're going to do a series. You are made for more. You're, you're made to multiply. You're made to make a difference. As a Christian, as a kingdom follower. Notice the reward. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. <laughs> Isn't that God views it a little? I just said you got a lifetime. Salary. You've been faithful over a little. I will put you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Again, we need to understand the kingdom is about joy, the kingdom is about life. We are kingdom representatives. We are here to bring joy to others. He also did the same thing with the two talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your servant. He also, who had received one talent, came forward. But he's going backward in his heart. Notice what he says. He says, Master, I knew you were a hard man. Reaping where you do not sow, gathering where you scatter no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master answered him. Now before we 
look at this consequence, some of us want to jump in, we just want to say, ah, this person, he's going to hell, he wasn't a believer to begin with. Notice that the, just like the, the virgins and the bridesmaids, they're all servants, then maybe he is going to hell, but I think maybe he's just losing out on his reward by what happens to him and misses out on his opportunity. But however you want to interpret it, either way, whether they're losing out on a reward or missing the kingdom altogether, it's a grave consequence. He says, you wicked, slothful, literally lazy, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew what, that I reap where I'm not sown and gather where I scatter no seed, that you ought to invest in my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, will more be given. And you will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness, in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a description of pain and agony because this servant missed out on the opportunity. He viewed his God as holding back on him. He viewed his one talent, a year's worth of wages, as something that he wasn't even willing to invest and to multiply for the kingdom. I want to close by giving you some practical advice on how you can move forward and how you can multiply your treasure. And on the screen here, I talk about four areas that you can multiply the treasure. And I am first talking about us as individuals who make up the kingdom. What can you be doing? And you're going to say, Mark, I think I heard this last week. Mark, I heard this last week. I heard this last week. Yes, there's going to be a common theme. I'm giving you not only the method but I'm also giving you the manner in which we do it. So the way you multiply your treasure, one of the methods today is to be in a group. And it doesn't matter if it's two, three, four, five, six, seven. You need to be in relationship with somebody, and I'm not talking about Sunday morning. Monday through Saturday, where you can be encouraged and you can encourage someone else. You need to get in the game. We talked about that, and we're going to do a whole series on how you get in the game, but I'm not talking again. I, I hear the needs every Sunday. We need somebody to greet. We need somebody to, to clean the church. We, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about personally serving one another, coming alongside and saying to someone, how can I meet your need this week? Jesus Christ taught his disciples that first and foremost, we are servants and we're called to serve one another. Next Sunday, we're going to look at generosity, but with a give first mentality. And some people come to church and some Christians are takers. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to get us to praise God in our prayer life, just so we're not coming to God and saying, come and meet my need. That's why Jesus gave us a pattern on how we are to pray. We, we need to be give first mentality. In fact, wouldn't you say if what Jesus taught us, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it, it's about love. That's what we give to God, and we love each other. A generous spirit is about love. And again, we're going to talk about that next Sunday, we're going to look at it as more blessed to give than to receive. That's all about love. And we multiply the treasure. Get this, we multiply the treasure when we ask people to sit with me. Again, that's a method. I would encourage you not just to think about sitting people to sit with you in church, or sit with you in a Sunday school class, or sit with you in a small group. Ask people to sit with you for lunch or for breakfast. If you're going to a ball game, don't just go to the ball game by yourself. Invite somebody to sit with you. And more importantly, ask somebody 
who is trying to figure out Christianity, somebody who's trying to figure out the kingdom, trying to figure out who God is, or somebody maybe that's just hurting and broken, invite them to sit with me. You see, that all means that you're going to welcome. Romans 15, 7 says we are to welcome one another. We are to accept one another, just as Christ has accepted us. Sitting with me will not work if we as a church aren't willing to welcome people, to be kind, to be gracious, to be generous. I have a handout that I've used multiple times. I should have put it on the screen, but I came across it. And it says, 10 things that require zero talent. And I'll have it up here afterwards if you, if you want to look at it or if you want to make a copy of it. But if you view yourself as a one talent, or we as a church view ourselves as a one talent church, guess what? These are 10 things we can do if we have limited talent. Being on time doesn't require any money to be on time. A good work ethic, effort, body language. This is huge. The way I mean, if I talk to my wife, Michelle, and say, I love you, <laughs> that's not going to work with her. She's talking to me, and I'm rolling my eyes, and arms crossed. Body language is huge. Energy. Attitude. Passion. Being willing to be coached, or being coachable. Doing a little bit extra. I found it interesting, number 10, is being prepared. I had a question asked last Sunday when we gathered together to talk a little bit about Transition 220 and what does it look like for me to be the transitional interim. And one of the questions was, was um, I think Brent, you asked it, well, what are we doing what? Well, what's happening? And this last slide, I want us to look at it from the perspective is, what, what can we be doing to multiply our talents as a church? And I, I list some things up here. Um, the first one, one of the things I've heard about just in some of my meetings with people was the Thanksgiving dinner. It's not, again, the method of the Thanksgiving dinner, per se. It's the attitude. You multiply the treasure when you start thinking outward. You stop as a church. We stop thinking about ourselves, and we start thinking about our neighbors. We think about the people who are unsaved, the people that aren't in church. And we do something from an outward mentality rather than an inward mentality. Too often in a church, we are scared about who we might lose rather than focusing on who we might be able to reach. We need to think from a multiplication standpoint with an outsider's perspective. Kingdom come. What do I mean by kingdom come? Again, we need to change our perspective that the church is not the end. The kingdom is the end. That will free us up as a church to do whatever it takes to advance the kingdom. Most of you, from what I'm gathering, this is about the only church you've ever known. Only one you've ever experienced. I, I've had the privilege of pastoring in 10 different churches, at least, and I've probably been a part of more than 10. And one of the things I've learned is there are many ways to do church, but it's not about the church, it's about the kingdom. And that's why our denomination is trying to help churches understand the kingdom missional agenda, which is to bring life to people. This transition time is a great opportunity for us. And as I said in one of the slides, it's an opportunity for us to seize the moment. Not to view ourselves from a limited standpoint, but to view ourselves as an unlimited standpoint and see what God has been doing. And last but not least is prayer. 
And probably one of the things I'd love to see is this church is very faithful with prayer requests. And I'm sure and I hope it's faithful with prayer. But the best way to multiply the treasure is to passionately pursue God and say, God, we are open as a church to do whatever it takes. Because my children, my grandchildren, my neighbor, my co-worker, my friends, they need Jesus Christ in their life. And that's more important than how we do church. It's about the kingdom that is to come. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that you were so masterful in your teaching that you could just make it black and white, wisdom and foolish. Multiply or bear. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will be a wise church and wise Christians, and I pray that we will be a multiplication church. And we will be multiplication Christians. <coughs> Protect us from the temptation to bury and hide what you have given us. And I thank you that you have entrusted us with the good news of the kingdom of God. I pray, dear Lord, that the words that I spoke, that your Holy Spirit will take and convict and change lives. And if I said something that was confusing or offensive, I pray, dear Lord, you'll put that aside so we can be the people that you've called us to be. And it is for your glory that we pray this. In Jesus' name.
Today's message focused more on us as Christians. But if you've never been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and if you don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you don't know if you're going to be prepared for a midnight cry, come and talk to me. I'd be glad to talk to you um, about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you his countenance and his peace until we meet again. God bless you and